Dr. Cheers will rejoin me on stage now as we think about segue into impact and different types of impact. So impact, different types, what does that mean? Impact in particular um, has a variety of different meanings and it can be the way in which you tell your story, the medium in which you tell your story, and the way in which you use it as a tool. Tom Zaki is building a business, building a movement, right. so around his storytelling, he's Absolutely. trying to teach but also Teach and also find the sense of humor in that. I love his reality show and using that medium to engage with a different audience. So you need to think about this. If you're a scientist, right, and you're writing an NSF grant, you're storytelling to persuade people that your science will lead to a breakthrough and you'll get funding. If you're a journalist, you might be giving, providing information just to inform people. Inform people, educate them around a different topic, provide different um, insight into something that they might or might not know. If you want to be a political leader, right, and you're out campaigning, you're trying to persuade and win people over. So the panel that we're going to bring up now yes. <clears throat> comes from three very distinct walks of life. Yeah, we have, uh, which is super exciting <coughs> because we have a variety from mm. journalists um, to policymakers and then even to corporate communicators. Absolutely. So let's invite our our panel up, yeah. Danielle Nkojo, she's from Rethread DC, from the Department of Edu uh, uh, Energy and Environment, Camille Stanley, St. Louis Public Radio, and the We Live Here podcast, and Kimberly West, Director of External Communication for Mars, Inc. Welcome. <laughs> and we'll speak for a bit and then open it up. Go ahead. Yeah, well, welcome, <clears throat> ladies. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'd love to start. Um, Danielle, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing um, at Rethread DC? Yeah, I was thrilled to hear the conversation turn toward textiles already today. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we were looking at is the waste stream in DC. I work on waste and materials management broadly, but certainly textiles were a passion of mine. Right. And we looked at the waste stream and just found out that people were treating their textiles as, as uh, trash. We wanted to turn that around. And so one of the things we did, instead of trying to uh, create our own collection system, we actually decided to elevate who was collecting currently. The programs that were working now, I'm actually very good friends with the DC Sustainable Fashion Collective. And we've really tried to amplify their message. Our key message is that clothing isn't trash, right? But we're trying to avoid the finger waving sure. and move more towards storytelling. How many times have you worn that jacket? More than three? More than three, and I bought it thrift. So. Awesome, all right. Nice. Actually, Camille Stanley, you join us from St. Louis. <laughs> SEO. You're, uh, yeah. Um, you're a podcaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and tell us a little bit about the podcast you do and what it's all about and who it's intended for. Yeah, so I've been a journalist for about uh, 10 years, mostly in print. But three years ago, I left my job at a newspaper in Florida to move to St. Louis and become a podcaster because I love podcasts. Um, and the podcast I do is all about race and class. Um, and it's a narrative storytelling podcast. And so um, race and class is kind of the whole universe. And so oftentimes we find ourselves looking, um, we, we put a race and class lens on everything that we do um, because I believe it exists in everything that we do and how we live. Um, so sometimes that takes us into um, the environment, but most often it's, um, uh, we're really focused on um, elevating, amplifying, and uncovering things that have to do with uh, with how people live and the way that these invisible s systems in our lives um, shape what we do and how we Camille, do it. Uh, th there's a lot of focus, and I think a lot of people in this room, because many of them have expressed it, um, are concerned about environmental equity. So mm -hmm. sort of extending this story to underserved communities and people who are often not engaged and included mm -hmm. in this conversation. Absolutely. Is that an issue? Is that a problem? Definitely, and, and I don't know if, um, it's not because these communities are not having these um, these conversations or that they're not addressing them in their own way. It's just that a lot of the avenue for traditional um, storytelling, they're discluded from that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it has to do with, no, these things are happening and people are working on their own solutions. It's just that we're not shining our camera lens, our um, mics, yeah. our pen and paper to that, or we're not even thinking about what they're doing as um, being able to be included in this conversation. No, that's really good. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, I'm curious, can you tell me how at Mars, what you're doing and how you all are utilizing um, your tools to help 
spread different messages. Sure, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm kind of a nerd about the blurring of lines between digital and paid and own, and I think it's all really fascinating. Um, you know, we, so, um, Mars has a really tradition, uh, a really. Um, you all know. Tradition. Sorry. Yeah. You all know Mars, right? Does everybody know. Anybody, Mars? anybody ever done M and M's? Yes. Okay. Yes. Anything else they should know about? Snickers, Twix. So it's it's probably a number of the treats that you love, but we also serve half of the world's pets. So and we're based here in D.C., which many people don't know. Um, we have a pretty, um, I would say, um, deep. Um, sustainability story and Mars announced in 2017 that we were launching what we call our sustainable in a generation plan mm -hmm. and it's a billion dollar investment over several years in three primary pillars um, and I think what's so fascinating about it is that announcement was really just the tip of the iceberg so to speak on the work behind that so we're really focused on science-based targets um, and we're really focused on on action-oriented plans and from a communications perspective you know, we are a company that historically has not done a whole lot of external communicating. We are a private family run local business here in, in the DC area. Um, but in the last few years, it's been figuring out how do we take what we want to say and move from thinking inside out with our storytelling to outside in? How do we do deeper analytics? How do we pull in and put the audience at the center of our stories? And then how do we figure out, like we just heard, how do we begin to humanize the story of sustainability? Because so much of what we do really kind of lives deep in our value chains. Yeah, that's awesome. Let me ask <coughs> each of you quickly, <coughs> as we talked about different types of impact, what kind of impact you're trying to have? How do you define impact which is gonna drive your storytelling, which is gonna drive your communication. What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Sure, um, at its core, you know, we are the city and we manage waste and we use taxpayer dollars to do that. We're spending over $200,000 a year to send clothing to waste to energy, 90% of which could be reused. Wow. So as a city, like at, at its very core, right, that's, that's our purpose here, to govern properly. So is your impact to get people to use less, to thrift more, to mm -hmm. donate more? What, what do you, what is, what do you, what's your target goal? Right, so the impact that I'm really trying to get at is to have people revalue their clothes, right? Mm. We can talk about the finger waving, we can talk about, you know, don't buy or, you know, shaming, but that's not it working, work. right? What's connecting people, I think, is to think about the story of their clothing, and that's why I love, like, something like Tribute, where they look at, um, you know, everyone wants to tell a story about a vintage piece, right? But a t-shirt has the same story, right? There are humans and human resources and natural resources that go into the yeah. making of that t-shirt that we've disconnected. What's the story from. of your clothing? Oh, That's well, awesome. yeah, I tend to, I, I love supporting in particular women and I travel throughout Sub-Saharan Africa annually and I'll go to different markets and I'll find different um, uh, textile makers and I'll select their fabrics and I have a lovely seamstress here in the DC area who just comes and she makes all sorts of fun designs for me. So this is one of her pieces that she made for me for today. Camille, what's your impact? What are you trying to do? Um, it's changed over the years since I've been a journalist because I've changed mediums. And so I think when I was a newspaper journalist, a lot of how I thought about impact had to do with the type of work I was doing, which was investigative reporting. And so in investigative reporting, you're looking for a result, usually from like an institution, maybe from a city government or something. Like, you know, you're getting somebody fired, you're getting a contract canceled, you're, you're making change, you're, you're, you're getting laws exposing changed. Exposing wrongdoing. Yes, all those types of things. Um, my idea of impact has definitely changed now that I'm a podcaster because of the nature of podcasting, you have such a different and oftentimes more intimate relationship with your audience. And so now the way I think about it is like, I'm trying to make money and meaning. Money because I'm in the media and it's a business and storytelling isn't free and I need to pay my bills. <laughs> uh, journalism, it, it takes money to do journalism. <laughs> um, and meaning because I've seen um, and have um, been shown by the audience the way that the what I make for them works and means for their lives. They've told me and that's something that's been um, it's been really cool to have a different and just as important kind of North Star for my work, so meaning. And your impact, are you trying to get people to consume less? Are you trying to make more, use less water, less packaging? I mean, what, what, do you, what, do you, what is Mars with this billion dollars trying to do? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the um, desired impact of the sustainable in a generation plan, it is to really begin to introduce this idea that it will require massive transformation and not incremental change to improve the lives of a million working people in our value chain, 
to do things like what we're aiming to do with our greenhouse gas emissions, which is to drive it down by 67 percent by 2025. So, wait, wait, wait. Yes. So you're trying to drive your green. Now, what does that mean? Let's just, just define that. For sure. So that means in our direct operations, so things that we control. Mm -hmm. Like making stuff. Exactly. Packaging. Exactly. It means doing things like moving to totally um, um, renewable power in, say, 10 of the countries where we operate. Yeah. Is that also impacting like fair trade and the way in which you work with, as you mentioned, people within your value trade? Yeah, so one of our pillars is the thriving people um, pillar and the idea there is ultimately to get to a place where we are positively impacting the lives of a million people who, who work with us. Um, I think what we're doing right now is exciting in that we're starting to do these pilots and programs that can be scaled up. Mm -hmm. So in Madagascar, where the price of vanilla um, continues to soar, and it's also a challenge for the people there because they need to protect their vanilla. We're trying to figure out how can you equip those communities with a way to protect the vanilla? How can you get a better way to build a more sustainable relationship with them so mm -hmm. that they're getting good prices, that we're getting good prices, and that it's a win-win? Okay, so you've all defined what your impact is gonna be. I think we should talk about how they're communicating that, yeah. and how you, how, how, what the story is. I am curious how you also differentiate within a crowded market like podcasts, within even a crowded market of um, candy and knowing that this Mars is a lot more than just candy, right? We mentioned the three mains that everyone loves. Um, and then also how are we doing it with uh, what we like to call fast fashion. Um, my students in my documentary class this week had to watch um, a documentary about fast fashion. At the beginning of the semester, they were looking at um, everything from Ava DuVernay's 13th, right, around these issues of race and class and mass incarceration. So how do you all in particular in all three of your fields like differentiate yourselves mm. with your impact? And storytelling, yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I think it's an interesting challenge because government has traditionally been in the position of kind of, you know, we'll put out a one pager, right? right. A, a, you know, a static page, that's, here's information, you know. Put it on the telephone it, pole, it's it really well. exciting. Right, or like we'll enforce, right? We're gonna ban things and we're gonna enforce. But really thinking about beyond that to behavior change is our challenge in our next frontier as leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things also is that I don't have the convenience of choosing a customer, right? I am here to serve everyone in the city, right? So that's race, class, gender, uh, like everyone, right, is my customer. So when I'm thinking about my messaging, right, I can't be narrow, right? I'm gonna get the ultra chic millennial that's interested in eco fashion. Mm -hmm. I can't just talk to them. I have to talk to the young men who are dealing on the corner who throw away their white t-shirts every day. Mm. So we have to have those broader so how do you conversations. Do that? How do you, how do you wow. talk across audiences like that? Are you putting up videos? Are you Instagramming? I mean, what's your social media? Tell us. Yeah, so one of the things we're doing first is we're doing a little bit of a partnership where we're gonna have kind of just visual a sticker in the window when you go by a store that's actually kind of participating in this ecosystem. But I think what the, the story I'm really trying to tell is connect people back. When I'm speaking, and I start talking about uh, you know what's happened in Bangladesh five years ago, five six years yeah. ago. You know, I, I my one of the stories I tell is about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. Absolutely. My mom was 14, and her job was to sew the toes in pantyhose. Wow. Right, that's what she did after school. So that See, that's true. That's, that's absolutely true. true. That story has a lot of impact for me. So when I tell that story, and then someone always raises their hand and wants to tell me about their favorite garment or piece of clothing. And they'll tell you like their aunt made it yeah. or you know, she saved up money and walked across town, you know, like an elaborate story about it. And I was like, Do you know the people who are making the t shirts that you're throwing away are someone's grandmother? So I just someone's aunt. I just wanna wow. I wanna button that. So as you think about your storytelling, what Danielle said is really important. You wanna personalize it, you wanna create a character. If that character is you or that character is somebody else that people can relate to, you start a conversation around that because you trigger the connections. For me, it's the opposite because in podcasting you need to be targeted. You need mm -hmm. to find your, your audience because the marketplace is so crowded. And that was a change for me from working again in print where I worked for a newspaper that had a general audience mm -hmm. right. to working and trying to make something that would um, means so much to someone that they would pull out a device 
right? They don't see a billboard. They don't just turn, it's not just in their yeah. cars. It's not radio. It's not terrestrial radio. They mm -hmm. have to go and choose it. And usually they have to know something about you to find you right. and then listen. And then you have to hook them. Then you have to get them to subscribe mm -hmm. and like love you mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> write you nice five star reviews only five star reviews please. <laughs> it's called We Live Here. Um, and so you have to do all that. And so first was figuring out how am I going to target this audience, and then figuring out um, okay how do we um, how do we get them to care about something that is about race and class, which there are a ton of people who eat, smell, breathe, love that stuff, talk about it all the time. There are a lot of other people who don't. Mm -hmm. And so um, for many people, they can feel like, and, and I work for a public radio station, right? So for some people, they're like, oh, yeah, I love NPR. <laughs> other people are like, turn it off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I try to say, like, we, ch we do give people broccoli, but we put a lot of cheese and butter on it. Mm -hmm. right. So <laughs> if you listen to my show, we're talking about race and class and we're laughing. Like we're having, you know, because that is the, we, we can talk so about humor. these things. Humor. Yes. Humor. humor, is that what you're saying? Yes, humor. And the other interesting thing I would say is um, be intentional and specific. I make a podcast about race and class in the middle of the country. I do not come out of a big megaphone. Um, even though I work for the NPR affiliate, NPR is not pimping my stuff, you know? Like, and I'm in a marketplace where I'm competing against 500,000 other podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to, um, to, how do I be distinct? I make it very specific. And interestingly enough, even though I do a show about race and class from St. Louis, 80% of our listeners are outside of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So uh, often when I'm talking to other journalists or people like, I wanna start a podcast and like, I wanna make it national and so they think they have to go very broad. Um, I'm like, you know how you make a national show? You make a local show. Mm -hmm. Because so many podcasts out there sound like they are from um, everywhere, mm -hmm. which everywhere meaning Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brooklyn by white guys. So they end up sounding like they're from everywhere and nowhere exactly. simultaneously. And so when you listen to We Live Here, hopefully you will, you'll get a flavor for St. Louis. That's the name of your podcast? Yes. Say it again. Five stars. Say it again. We live here. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so you you mentioned broccoli with lots of cheese on it. I one of the one of the best things I ever heard from a reporter was like we were deep into pitching a story and it was like several interviews in and he was like, look, my editor needs me to serve dessert first. And yeah. I was like, ah, so well said. So I think when we think about our storytelling, it's okay. Yeah, you you may have to start with the sizzle because that's what'll get you to the table. So this is the end user impact story. This mm -hmm. is the new technology that's making a new sustainability program possible. But then you're able to come to the table and provide you know, the richness and the depth of what your organization is doing. Um, from a Mars perspective, I mean, we are on quite a journey communications wise. This is a company that historically has been very comfortable having zero profile externally. So we're kind of on this journey where we've just been building broad-based awareness of who we are. Mm -hmm. And we're now turning into, okay, it's time to think about engagement. And you're trying, gonna, engagement around the sustainability story. Sustainability, but also engagement around the people who may want to work at Mars. You know, we're 115,000 people, but we may have to recruit 75,000 additional people in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So how do you attract somebody if they don't know who you are? But it's going to require not only knowing who you are, but then also engaging you. How do we talk about things in a way that resonate with you, but then also find you where you are? Because not everybody's going to flip up, you know, pull out their phone and scroll to Mars.com. Should we take a question or two from the audience? Anyone? Yeah. Anybody got a question for our panelists, podcasters? Uh, There's oh. a question in the corner. Okay. Got a mic over here. I think they're coming. It's on the way. Hi, Vinka. Hi, I'm, I'm Jerry Bloom. I'm part of the Planet Forward Advisory Board. And this is awesome, of course. Um, I want to direct, <laughs> direct my question to Kimberly. Uh, I'm working with you guys, but Mars, what you were just talking to, that you're not only looking at uh, green in terms of renewable energy, but you're one of the leaders now. I'm working on a thermal collaborative, and Mars is right out in front. And my question is two issues, and then the second one is what you just brought up. Sustainability is now a labor issue, a recruitment mm -hmm. issue for corporates across the globe, and they really need to do this because people, the students coming out of school, really care where they work and what, and what those companies are and what they stand for. Mm -hmm. And it's become a 
key variable in, in the interviewing and, and recruitment process and labor employment issue. Very different than anything we looked at in the past. My question is, in terms of Mars and sustainability, how are you deciding between renewable energy, between recycling, between your wrapping, your packaging, all the different things that, what goes into the prioritization of what you're looking at and why you're looking at, and how do those things merge in terms of the story you want to tell to be a responsible company that people respect and want to work at? Mm, that's a really good question. It's great to hear that we're working with you. Um, so I am not the I'm not the incredible you know scientist that we have behind all of those decisions. But what I can tell you is that you know we are a family owned business. So this is very much at the core of what the family feels is really important, and that you know as the shareholders they are driving the agenda for the company. Mm -hmm. So it's those angles of sustainability that matter. And also it's because everything that we do is science based. So once we introduced that sustainable in a generation plan, that was like 10 years of work to figure out how we looked at the very deepest roots of the raw ingredients that we that we sourced. There are 23 of them. And then we said, "Oh my gosh, of those 23, 10 of those drive 80% of the impact that we have on the climate. So let's start there. Let's figure out what we do with cocoa. Let's figure out how we start to think about palm. And we, so it's always starting with the science in mind and then also knowing that the shareholders really drive the agenda. And then figuring out how to tell that so people can understand it who aren't, it, who aren't doing point. the science. One more question from the floor. Uh, let's go to Zach here. Hi, uh, for everybody, I'm Zach Smith. Uh, this question would be directed at uh, Camille for the podcast. Um, in hearing you talk about your podcast and getting that up off the ground and the importance of directing your story to be specific uh, rather than being extremely broad in podcasting, I'm sure you had um, maybe a, a struggle at first getting the ball rolling and in any sort of communication aspect or podcast or uh, platform, getting the ball rolling of people knowing about your show, subscribing to it. How did you get that ball rolling? The creation of the content, I think, is the easy part. Getting that ball rolling so that people know and say, hey, did you hear about this podcast? Did you hear about this? You, sh you should listen to that. So building, how do you build the audience? Yeah, how do you build Especially the from scratch, yeah. Great um, question. I, I'm going to disagree with you at one point. Um, making Please. the content is not e easy. <laughs> so any content creators in the room know that, um, yes, content, um, content creation is work. And um, but so is the added step, if, especially if you're a podcaster. So how do you build your audience? I hate to tell you like that I am in no different position than if anybody in this room wants to start up a podcast now. I have to work for every single listener. And podcasting, one of the beautiful things about it is that um, people um, have a higher level of trust because it is, um, it isn't, right now it seems uh, kind of on the edge of other types of media. And I think people are so inundated with so many different types of media that they want something different. Um, and because it's, um, it's an intimate medium, people feel like they get to know me. They don't, but they feel like they get to know me which, because they're hearing, you know, they're hearing, they're getting the story through my voice. Um, but it is still very guerrilla marketing style. So because you have a higher level of trust, if I tell you, um, you should listen to this podcast, mm -hmm. that holds so much more weight than like, if you see a billboard or other types of advertising, mm -hmm. which is why one time, uh, right now, one of the biggest ways to maybe grow your audience in podcasts is not for you to go like, you know, buy a billboard or things like that. My um, public radio station, we tried a lot of, in, in the beginning we tried like, oh, we should put in like an advertisement in the newspaper or something like that. Um, and I'm from a person, I love newspapers. <laughs> but you know what really works is figuring out maybe if there's another podcast who think has a um, an has the audience that you're trying to get, right? Work out a deal with them where you have cross promos. Because if I listen to We Live Here and I love Camille, right? And at the end of her show, she says, y'all, go listen to this other podcast. I might do it. As opposed to me just seeing something randomly. Um, so cross promotion is huge in podcasts. Um, and that is a way to kind of grow, uh, grow your audience. And it's, so that's, and that speaks to the power of social media too. So yes. if you hear from somebody you know and you trust, yes. and this is actually across all of these things, in yes. all of your communication, all of your storytelling, if you can be getting people that other people know and trust yes. to know, to hear, to do, that 
I'm it, sure. And a, a lot of the big, fresh. a lot of the big podcasts, like you, you have to pay to do that. Like, mm -hmm. so a lot of these things, like recommendations, some of it's like because the hosts <laughs> like each other and the, the shows are like cousins. But some of it is like people are putting money behind it. However, don't let that stop you. If there's other podcasts that you like and they're smaller podcasts, call them up, send them an email, and be like, hey, you want to like cross promote each other's shows? You want to like come on my show and be like a I can interview your host, you can interview my host. Mm -hmm. Like start small and just like cuz word of mouth is still um how people discover podcasts. Discoverability in podcasts is still the hugest the um our hugest challenge. So I think you guys are all going to be around for a little bit and we'll be able to be out during our break which is going to be coming up in a, in a few minutes and if you have other questions or you want to come and talk to them, please do. But we we're going to move on now. Thank you all and join us in Thank thanking you.